<laughs> well, I appreciate for those that could attend today. I know uh, taking time out of the busy day is hard. Uh, I completely understand. And who wants to take time out of their day to talk about mortgages? Like not the fanciest subject in the world, uh, but um, a subject that can begin that wealth generation and, of course, take uh, advantage of the market and, you know, basically spread uh, your assets and, you know, financial uh, gains appropriately. So um, anyway, all that being said, um, as Nicola mentioned, um, this is a VA loan seminar. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a number of slides, um, not to bore you to death. Uh, no one likes death by PowerPoint. But the point is, there's a lot of information that needs to come across. Um, and it in regards to the benefits of the VA loan, why you want to use it, why it's like the greatest mortgage product out there. Um, and going knowing those details and knowing the guidelines that are currently written allows you to use this product um, more than once, you know, and for future um, purchasing uh, opportunities. But so real quick, a little uh, background on myself. Uh, name's Austin Yagel. I'm a loan officer with Cross Country Mortgage. Um, I'm here in Oceanside, California. Um, but um, with Cross Country, uh, one of the, the great things about uh, that company and, and what we do is that we can facilitate loans in any state. So regardless of your PCSing, you know, from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, California, I mentioned those just because obviously prior Marine, um, but we can facilitate kind of as you as you jump around um, at, at different different states, different locations. But um, I will tell you. Uh, a little background on myself, I did 10 years in the Marine Corps uh, active duty, um, unfortunately hit the Marine Corps lottery and got 29 palms right out the gate. Uh, not necessarily the best in the world, but from there to Quantico, and that's where I used my VA loan for the first time. Um, and then, of course, when I left, rented that out, got out here at Camp Pendleton, and then used my VA loan a second time. And I've also refied both of those properties, um, some conventional, some VA. So definitely have experience not only just using the product, um, but now on this side of the fence, helping facilitate uh, the use of the product for other veterans and active duty service members. Um, and now currently, I'm a drilling reservist. I actually drill out of Marine Corps Air Station Miramar here in Southern California. Um, and facilitate, you know, veterans and active duty service members um, in their, you know, their uh, path to gain wealth in real estate. So all that being said, we'll dive right in. Um, so first of all, what is the VA loan, right? Um, everybody hears about this great uh, product that's out there, and you've got to know the details of whether or not you're eligible, what it can do for you. But first, out the gate, what is it, right? It's actually a guaranteed benefit that service members have available to them. And what that really means is that the VA is backing that loan. So if the veteran or the service member, for whatever reason, has any issues, um, you know, uh, making payments or they're foreclosing on that property, the VA actually guarantees up to 25% of that loan amount. And really what that does is that pays out the bank, right? So if we have to take a loss on it, right, they're going to pay us out and the veteran is not charged that. So because of that, right, there's a lot more benefits that come with this product. Um, but really, that's what the VA is doing. You know, they're not they're not actually doing the loans, they're not taking applications, uh, but they're essentially providing that guarantee. And they're the ones that write all the guidelines that we lenders have to abide by when we're actually helping facilitate a loan. A um, little history lesson here. Um, VA loan came about in 1944 um, through what we know as the GI Bill um, or the appropriate term Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Um, that was because, you know, after World War II, everyone's coming back, all the service member, men and women coming back. Um, we're reintegrating into society. And of course, um, having uh, the ability to use the VA home loan benefit or education benefit helped ease that transition back into civilian life. Um, so that is kind of the birthplace um, of the VA loan. And then lastly, um, the intent of the loan is to be used for your primary residence, right? And because of that, um, the products, like I said, the VA loan is not just for purchase. They have refinance products, rental products, construction products, all those exist. Um, but most of them apply towards um, your primary residence um, in only certain cases like a VA EARL or IRRL to interest rate reduction refinance loan. Um, that's where you can use that on a pr previous uh, primary residence that may still have the VA loan on it. So um, lots of great products. Um, and yeah, we'll start working through those um, here uh, in a second. Um, another thing is a lot of people come to me and ask a lot of veterans, hey, I don't even know if I'm eligible. And I kid you not, I had um, a veteran that I helped was a year, I think it's about a year ago now. Um, he was a father of a real estate agent I was working with. 
and they wanted to get into the home they had been renting off like 20 years and older gentleman and i asked him just because i always want to uh to know as a hey by the way have you ever served in the military and he's like yeah i was in the army right well come to find out even though it was back in the 70s right and maybe it was only for a few years i was like great i said do you know you're possibly eligible for the va loan he had no idea so we submitted a dd214 to the va and lo and behold we got a certificate of eligibility and we're able to get him into the home at zero down right had no idea Idea. But the problem is a lot of times veterans don't even know that they're eligible um, in some cases, depending on you know when they served. Um, but knowing what it, the requirements are definitely helps you and knows that you can use that product going forward. Now, at the end of the day, as a lender, we're going to go out and find um, through the VA that you are eligible. But one thing to know, if you're active duty right now, as long as you have 90 days of continuous service, you're already eligible, right? Um, so by the time you get out of training into that first duty station, you can purchase your home, like no joke. And a lot of times, not necessarily, the, I know the Marine side of the house, but some of the other services, you get BAH right out the gate in, in some locations, like a great opportunity to take that asset and put it towards a mortgage. Um, for National Guard and Reserve members, um, they have a little bit longer of a wait period. Uh, they need at least six years of credible service. And what that means is in the reserve world, now that I'm well aware of it, is that 50 points is the minimum amount of points you are required to have in order to um, have what's like known as a satisfactory year or a year towards retirement. And that having six of those, right, allows you to be eligible for the VA loan. Now, there is a way to not necessarily get around this, but to accelerate it. And that's if you take orders, you go deploy, you're under Title 10. Those all result in a DD-214, right, when you come back and you come off of orders, and that'll tell you know, VA that you've had active duty service time. And therefore, and I know this from personal experience, um, some of my Marines down at uh, the air station, they actually were LA, no, Long Beach Police Department, uh, a couple of them. They deployed to Bahrain. Um, they came back, they got a DD-214. They'd only been in the service for about three years. So they didn't have that six years. And we took the DD-214, went to the VA, proved they've had 90 days of continuous service on active duty, right? got the certificate of eligibility early and they went out and bought homes zero down. So like I said, not a way to, you're not manipulating the system, you're just accelerating that timeline. And then lastly, excuse me, qualified surviving spouses of veterans. Um, there's a list of uh, eligibility that's tied to surviving spouses. A lot of it's either killed in action, uh, missing in action, um, or if a veteran passed but had, you know, based on service connected disability reasons, things like that. Um, but if you fall in that category, we definitely look that up and talk to the VA about it. But those are all of the three different ways that you could be eligible for the VA loan. So now that we know that, let's get into some of the um, amazing benefits of, of the VA loan. And please feel free, uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning, um, as I'm going through these, I know I'm just throwing a bunch of information at you, but if it stimulates questions, um, just start filling that, that chat up with all the questions you may have. And what we'll do is um, I'll knock them down all at the end. And then, of course, I have a list, I guess, that was given prior to that I can start kind of weeding through as well. But uh, so first great advantage, uh, the VA loan, which you probably see all over the media anyway, is that you could do up to 100% financing. Now, what does that really mean? It means that you don't bring a down payment unlike a conventional loan. So if you look at the alternative, right, a conventional loan, you know, for someone who's not eligible for the VA loan would have to bring a minimum of 3%, right, for a down payment on a first time home buyer conventional loan. On a $400,000 purchase, that's like 12 grand, right? So that's a lot of money. The thing is with the VA loan, it's basically cost avoidance. Like you are not having to bring a down payment, um, you know, to the table. Now, one thing, and obviously it's happening now in the market, you're seeing a lot of this, um, and it's that second bullet point there, purchase price can't exceed the appraised value. So let me kind of explain you know, what that means. When you, let's say you're, you're shopping and you're looking for a home and you find one that's $400,000 or listed at 400 grand, you put an offer in for $400,000. And then when you get the property appraised, it comes back at $405,000. Well, great. Guess what? I use the lesser of two values, right? the purchase price or the appraised value. And if it came out of four or five, it came over, but you're purchasing at 400, like congratulations, best case scenario, you just bought into five grand of equity, right? Now the alternative does exist. If the appraisal comes in lower, let's say it comes at 390, that's 10 grand in difference, right? Well, guess what? If the value of the home is 390, that as a lender, that's all the bank can give you is 390. Therefore it's like, well, how do we get to that 400 then? Because that's what the seller and I have agreed upon. Well. There's a couple ways. One is either ask the seller to come down, right? 
um, which if they're nice enough, they do. If not, then you actually have to come up with the difference. So that's essentially like a down payment of sorts um, is that you have to buy down to that 390 um, because you still agreed upon that 400 price. And if you're not willing, if neither party is willing to do either option, then um, you can just drop out a contract at that point because the, uh, the VA obviously escape clause allows you to do so. The VA is not going to lend money on a home that is not worth what you're purchasing it for. So it's a little bit of a protection and like a catching feature in there for veterans, which is amazing. Um, uh, but just something to be mindful as you kind of go forward. And the reason why I bring it up, especially right now and really harp on it is because with the market starting to begin its shift, um, you went from that crazy, crazy seller, you know, seller market that's happening in the beginning of this year where people are coming in, you know, tons of money, tons of cash over asking, things like that. Well, now that is, you know, inflation and all that, all that's starting to turn, well, you're starting to see, you know, home values. They're not, everybody keeps thinking they're going down just because you're seeing price drops. No, what's happening is appreciation is starting to slow, right? So instead of, you know, homes appreciating at, you know, double digits, like 15 to 20%, they're just slowing down to where they should be at, which is like that two to 4% range, right? So don't perceive it as like, you know, market, you know, crashing and things like that. It's just appreciation is slowing down and it's starting to regulate itself. Um, and then all that being said, of course, it's all subject to qualification, right? If you can't afford, like your debt to income ratio doesn't support, right, a $400,000 loan, uh, obviously, um, then you're not going to be able to attain that. But when you go through a pre-approval, that's the whole point of what I do. We look at all the numbers, we crunch it all, and we come out and say, hey, this is the max that you can afford, and that's what you should be shopping to or under, right? Um, so that covers everything regarding the, the financing or the 100% financing portion. Another great advantage uh, to the VA loan is that there's no private mortgage insurance. So mortgage insurance, um, and I every time I do the seminars, especially like in person, um, I always like to ask the audience like what mortgage insurance does, right? At the end of the day, mortgage insurance protects the bank, it protects us, right? Now that can range from like 50 to $200, depending on the loan size, uh, the credit profile. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it and also the down payment size, but all that pertains to conventional mortgages. So anything less than 20% down, you take on mortgage insurance, right? The lower, the lower money or less money you bring to the table, higher the mortgage insurance. Well, once again, benefit of the VA, you're bringing nothing to the table and you still don't have any mortgage insurance. And that's because the VA guarantees a loan. That is the mortgage insurance policy, right? So whenever something happens or goes wrong, right? And the bank has to take a hit, then that's where the VA steps in. And because they're willing to back you and say, hey, you've done your time, right? You're eligible for the benefit. The VA says, don't worry, we have you if something goes wrong, right? And that's why you don't have mortgage insurance. Um, one thing to be cognizant of though, um, the VA funding fee uh, is something that is applicable to every VA loan. Um, so if you're active duty or separated, um, you're gonna see a VA funding fee, which is 2.3% for first time use of the VA loan. And it's 3.6% for every subsequent use of the VA loan. So a second, third, fourth, fifth time. I mean, I mean, it was a little bit, a little dated here, but when I purchased the first time, it was actually 2.15. Um, and then of course, when I got out here to Pendleton, I had to pay the subsequent fee as well. The only time that you are um, not subject to the funding fee is when you actually receive uh, disability compensation from the VA. So when you're usually, obviously during separation, you go through, um, it's not steps and taps, um, TRS, uh, the transition readiness seminar, they are going to instruct you to like, submit your, you know, your claim and all that prior to your, your separation. And then upon separation, right, the VA will either award you um, or not award you a disability rating, which as long as you have 10% or more, you will receive compensation for. So as long as you receive compensation, you can either have it at 10% or 100%, you still are exempt from the VA funding fee for every usage of the VA loan going forward. Um, so that's the only time that you're exempt. And the best part is when we pull your certificate of eligibility during the pre-approval, it actually states that COE gives me everything. It tells me if you're on subsequent use of the VA loan, it tells me if you've used it before um, and you still have a loan out because that, that loan actually would be on um, the COE. And then at the bottom, it actually tells me if you're receiving compensation from the VA. So that one page document gives me your entire VA history profile, whatever you want to call it. Um, in one fail swoop. And then we take the information from there and that's how we build out your loan. Um, but like I said, once again, just something to be you know, cognizant of, I literally just had a conversation with a veteran um, this morning actually um, out in Florida. 
and he was working with another lender and they didn't tell him anything like this. All of a sudden he sees his, you know, his loan estimate or his closing disclosure comes to him. And all of a sudden his loan is more. He's like, where did this extra, you know, nine grand or 10 grand come from? And they didn't explain it to him. They didn't you know, prep him for that. And what happened is, you know, we started talking to me, we started doing some math and I explained it was the VA funding fee, right? It's just, that is, it's a, it's part of the, the, it's the cost of doing business essentially, right? Like the VA can't continue to guarantee all these loans for all the veterans after you, if there's not some kind of cost, right? And so that's where the, the funding fee comes into play. So another great advantage, uh, going on to the next one, uh, closing costs. So once again, a huge misnomer. I have a bunch of veterans that come to me and they're like, hey, I heard I can get into a you know, home for, for, for nothing at all, for free. And it's like, I hear you, right? And there are instances out there where veterans have gotten into homes with no cash out of their pocket. And those are very unique. Um, and I'll explain to you kind of how they did that. But um, the VA and the guidelines, the way that they're, they're written do help put some caps on some of these closing costs. But at the end of the day, despite the VA funding fee, when doing a pre-approval, we always look for roughly two to three percent in cash that you have on hand to pay what's known as closing costs. And closing costs is a combination of many, many things. You have your impound account uh, where taxes, insurance are housed, right? So a mortgage is made up of four things, right? You have your principal, you have your interest, right? Principal pays down, no kidding, the balance of the loan. Your interest, that's a profit that goes to the bank, right? For lending the money. And then you have taxes and you have insurance. Taxes, that rate is set by the county that you're purchasing in, but you have to preload uh, an impound account, a holding account essentially, that's gonna pay that on your behalf when they come due. And so there's, um, uh, it depends on the time of year taxes are due, but it could be a significant amount that you have to prepay during closing. And then also insurance, right? Insurance is that fourth item. You choose the insurance policy for your home, right? You pay a full annual premium up front, and then you also preload a couple months into your impound account. So that's one aspect of closing costs right there. And that's usually about one third, maybe a little more um, of your total closing costs. And then you have title and escrow fees. Out in California, we do escrow. On the East Coast, typically it's just a title attorney, things like that. Um, but they have associated fees with their transaction, right, with the transaction based on the house and the purchase price. Um, obviously, you know, the notary fees, the title insurance, all those, when you start adding that together, um, then that adds another, you know, maybe a third or so. And then of course, appraisal, credit report and things of that nature. But all that being said, roughly two to 3%, right? Um, the one great thing about the VA, and this is kind of where I'm going to get into how do veterans get into homes for free kind of thing. And like I said, they're very unique. And I, I've had, I've actually had it happen recently, um, or actually earlier this year, I believe, um, a veteran was buying a home out in Jackson, Florida. And, and as you see there, that third bullet or that first sub bullet says up to 4% um, can be used or can be received from the seller as contributions towards closing costs. So a lot of times I'll have veterans and I, I personally did this when I bought my first house. Now it was definitely a little more buyer friendly back then where I came to the table and I asked for the seller to pay for closing costs. Um, he came back and countered, hey, I'm only gonna pay half your closing costs. But, hey, to me, it was a win, right? Well, in the case of this Jacksonville, Florida deal, the, the the borrower asked through the real estate contract for about 10 grand or 10 grand in closing costs. The seller was willing to do about half, right? About five. Well, then as they went through and they did inspections on the property and things of that nature, right? There were repairs that needed to be done and they went ahead and negotiated more seller credit in lieu of repairs. So what happened is at the end of the day, this borrower ended up getting $19,000 um, for, uh, for seller credit. The benefit of the VA loan is that any overage that you have past closing costs, because his closing costs were only 10 grand, right? And so we're like, wait, what are we gonna do with all this extra money? So you can't receive it back in cash. It has to be used during the transaction. Now, the benefit of the VA loans, they allow it to use it towards other debts you have. So no joke, we took 10 grand, we paid off all the closing. He got his EMD back in cash, right? The money he put into the deal, he got back, um, which is the deposit you put on with the contract. And then the rest of the money we put towards an auto loan, like straight to Navy Fed, like here, pay this off, right? So great, great advantage of the VA loans that you can use that excess for many other things. Um, but at the same time, um, that was just an example I wanted to provide you of how veterans in some cases can get into a house for free, but that is not very common whatsoever. Usually there's a portion, if not all the closing costs you have to be paid for by the borrower as you go through the transaction. All right, um, another benefit, and which also a huge misnomer, like there's so many people, I cannot believe when I start going through the details of this, that you can use your benefit over and over. Um, there's 
three ways that you can, yeah, three ways you can really do this. First is you can buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell as many times as you want. Now, every time, once you hit that second time though, every time after that, I mean, you're paying that funding fee 3.6% over and over and over. And usually that pertains to like your active duty personnel that keep bouncing duty station to duty station, right? Um, they kind of rinse and repeat the same thing, right? They take the equity or whatever they made on that previous sale and they roll into the next one, right? So that's probably one of the most common ways. Um, another way you can do it is that you can use your tier two benefit or essentially pick up two homes um, under the same un eligibility umbrella that you have. Um, I personally did this when I left Quantico. So I purchased a town home in Quantico uh, with the VA loan. And when I came out to Camp Pendleton, the county loan limit, this is the only time the county loan limit comes into play, is a lot higher out here because of higher cost of living. You subtract essentially what you've already burned in eligibility from the the county loan limit of the place that you want to purchase in. And that delta, that difference is what you can go zero down up to, right? So I was able to keep that home and then buy another home zero down with the VA loan, right? So that's the second way you can use it. A third way is let's say you purchase a home out here in California, the high cost area of living, usually you're gonna burn all your eligibility. And if you go anywhere else, a lot of times the county loan limit is actually lower. So that if you did that same math, you'd actually be negative. Therefore you have no eligibility left. So I was like, well, what am I going to do if I want to tap into my VA um, uh, loan again? Well, you can refinance, right, the home into a conventional loan prior, right, prior to you, if you know, like, hey, I'm going to leave, I'm going to use it again at some point. Um, and I actually just, I personally did this on my primary residence, I refinanced to a conventional loan. So now... I can do what's known as a one-time restoration of benefits. I can actually go to the VA, show them the closing disclosure or the settlement statement, say, hey, I no longer have a VA loan on this property. They say, great. They essentially wipe the slate clean and they put a little paragraph at the bottom of your COB and says, hey, he's performed a one-time or she's performed a one-time restoration of the benefits. Therefore, you have full eligibility. And when you have full eligibility, you have no limit. So you can go out and buy, if you can qualify for a million dollar property, you can have it, right? So that's a way, a third way that you can actually use uh, the VA loan uh, twice. I guess a little bit more cost involved because you have to refinance um, out of it, but um, just something to be mindful of as you kind of go forward. And the fact that just because you use it once doesn't mean you can't use it again. All right. And then um, lastly, I was already touched on uh, no loan limit. So that actually was very recent. So January 1st of 2020, um, they took away having to use the conforming loan limits, which if you go online and just put in uh, FHFA uh, county loan limits, a PDF is out there and that'll actually show you um, what the county loan limits are by county for the entire United States. And that's kind of what we base that tier two math on if necessary. Um, another thing is uh, the rates, uh, compared to competitive, or I'm sorry, compared to conventional loans, if you were to price out the same loan and looked at VA versus conventional, the VA is going to beat it like every day. I mean, and it, it's a variation of what it's going to, you know, be uh, reduced by. It could be a quarter of a percentage point. It could be a half a percentage point. I mean, it, all that is based on the bond market. And of course, I mean, I'm sure everybody's watching these days, but um, the economy is pseudo on fire, right? You got this huge volatility taking place. I mean, last week was it bonds, stocks, you know, crypto, everything was just tanking like crazy before the feds met and the feds came out like, Hey, we're going to raise it three quarters of a point. And I mean, all good things for the mortgage world. But um, that being said, at the end of the day, although that funding fee is added onto the loan, the offset cost by reducing the rate helps mitigate some of that uh, for your monthly, right? So your principal and interest is a little bit less compared to a conventional mortgage. And plus you don't have the PMI, you don't have the down payment. So when you wrap all that together, if you do the, the comparison, the VA is gonna beat any other product that you have out there. Um, let's see, and then, okay. So those are all the, the advantages. And I, a lot of it's geared towards purchases, but there's a couple other products that I wanna talk about um, that I see probably very commonly. Um, one of which is the, oh no, my computer's not being fun. Give me one second. Now the PDF, there we go. Um, the VA Streamline Refinance, sorry about that. So the VA Earl, which I briefly touched on on the very first slide, um, the Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan. So this loan is unique in the fact that you can use it on a primary residence, but if in the scenario where you kept the loan on the first property and you bought with your tier two eligibility, you can actually use um, um, the VA Earl on the investment property, the one you're renting out. Um, so in my case, the one that was on the East Coast, I could do a VA Earl on it and not actually live there. 
uh, which is unique compared to the other products, right? All the other ones require it to be a primary residence, but VA Earl does not. So as long as I still have a VA loan on that investment property, I can use this to refinance and actually bring the rate down lower. Now, there's a few things that you have to do. It has to be a financial gain to the veteran, meaning it's either shortening the term of the, of the loan, it's reducing the reducing the rate uh, by half a percentage point, right? Um, and then also you're recouping all the fees associated with your finance within 36 months. So there's a lot of things involved in it, but it's a great tool. I did, actually personally did this on my, on my primary residence um, a couple of years ago, but the, um, there's no appraisal, there's no income verification. I mean, it's like a lot less documentation than you would if you went through a purchase, but great tool to have, um, especially when you're in the, this kind of market where you know, you want to get into a home, you want to start building wealth, and pay, uh, uh, building wealth and paying down equity, but you know the rates are high, right? But you have a streamlined refinance that after six months of great payments, right, you are now eligible to perform a VA Earl. So rates tend to start trending downward, which we anticipate they do come this fall or next spring based on inflation and the chaos going on. Then this is a tool that veterans can use um, to get into a better rate at very minimal cost. Now, the alternative is, you can also do a VA refinance cash out. Now, the difference is this one has to be used on a primary residence and you are essentially like almost repurchasing your entire house again, meaning it has to have an appraisal. We got to make sure it's worth what you say it is. Also, there's termite. We got to make sure that um, if you've done a, a recent uh, report within the last 90 days, then we can use that report. But they want to make sure that there's no termite damage and that the house is being kept up. And then they will look at it and usually about 90% loan to value is kind of as high as you want to go. You can do 100% loan to value just like you would if you were purchasing, um, the, but pricing changes significantly. So I always kind of advise people look at 90%. If it meets all your intent and what you want to use the cash for, then that's probably the best way to go. But as you see, there are a few examples of what I see a lot of veterans using uh, cash out refinances for, uh, first of which, and the biggest one is paying off debt. So consolidating, you know, multiple car loans, um, consolidating high credit card, you know, debt, things like that, because now you're wrapping all that into a very low interest rate compared to some of the interest rates that they had. I've seen you know, anywhere from, you know, five to 20, 25% interest rates on some of this stuff, right? So wrapping all underneath, you know, lower interest rate definitely is financially, um, uh, advantageous in that, in that way, but also you can use the money to improve your home, uh, college. I mean, pick your flavor kind of thing, other investments. Um, but there's a way to tap your equity, uh, with the VA loan. And a lot of times I see people do this if they bought a home, um, you know, actually my parents are one of them. They bought a home. They actually didn't use the VA loan. And then we actually did a VA cash out, didn't take any cash out, but just put them in the product because it gave them a way better interest rate. Right. So like I said, other advantages and things that you can do if you want to be uh, creative with the, uh, uh, the product itself. Okay, so at the end of the day, everyone's like, eh, this is all great information, but I have you know no idea where to start. And that's typically part of the problem with the veteran community. Um, it's just that, you know, as you go through it, my first duty station, nobody told me about this. If I would have known about the VA loan and my eligibility, I most likely would have purchased on my first duty station. It wasn't until I was in my second tour that I was around people that already had multiple homes that I started getting real smart on this. And a lot of times the seminars I do, all the veterans that are there just don't know enough about the product to even know where to begin, right? So with that being said, to get started on, on looking into a mortgage, I mean, it's very similar to any other conventional mortgage or any mortgage you would get. Obviously, we're going to want um, information regarding your income. If you're active duty, super simple. Jump on my pay. You grab an LES, the last two years of your W-2s, right? And those three documents prove your income. And then assets. So we want to make sure when we look at bank statements, we want to make sure you have the cash available to pay that closing cost we talked about earlier. So that two to 3%, that's what I'm looking for to make sure that you can take care of closing costs. Because if not, then we're getting creative and we're either asking for seller credit, you're getting a gift from a family member or something like that. And sometimes, um, obviously those are not, especially when you're asking the seller to pay all your closing costs and there's an offer sitting right next to it from someone who's not asking for that, you could see where the seller is gonna be more apt to choose one that is not asking for that. So like I said, having that cash on hand um, is a great, uh, great thing to have. And then of course, um, you know, ID insurance, if you already have, you know, insurance providers, things like that. But really at the end of the day, um, what matters most about the VA loan and people are eligible for that is that the certificate of eligibility, which if you want to go out and check your own, you can, I think the VA.gov website or the e-benefits website, you can actually go out there and pull it yourself. Um, we have access to the VA portal and I just use your information from the application. 
to pull your COE. And then that's where I get that full history of kind of, if you've used the product before, if you're receiving disability, I mean, the full, um, the full monthly there. So that having the COE is kind of like your golden ticket. And then if it's not out there, um, or you have since separated from the military, a lot of times we're going to ask the DD-214. So the DD-214 can either allow us to go to the VA to fight for you to get a certificate of eligibility if you don't have one. A lot of times this happens with reservists because, as you can imagine, government systems don't talk to each other. So you have one, tracks all the COEs, right? And usually active duty stuff is in there, but all the reservists, when they hit that six-year mark, it's not talking to the VA, right? So we have to prove that service in that DD-214 um, or a statement of service um, helps us do that. Um, and then of course, if you have since separated, having that tells us you know, what your discharge was so that we know that you're still eligible. And then um, of course, the VA awards letter. A lot of times your certificate of eligibility, if you were just gotten out of the service, your VA disability has not, pre, has not populated on the COE. So when we are looking at using that disability income towards qualifying, we want that awards letter. Plus it tells us the date that it started, which, which can matter if you're like right about the transition um, and you're going to have to pay that VA funding fee. So just something to be aware of as you, as you kind of go forward um, looking for a, a home loan. And then um, lastly, the biggest thing is, and, and actually the reason why I even had that conversation this morning with that, that veteran out in, in Florida is that the lender that they were working with did not understand or know a lot of these details when it comes to the VA loan. I mean, don't get me wrong, all lenders, all loan officers, we have the same certificate, same license, right? Same certification as necessary to do what we do, but we're not all cut from the same cloth. And what I mean by that is not all of them have the, um, either the service connection or the experience, right? Like I've been looking at LES in my entire life. Um, I know what transitions between duty station and duty station looks like, what to facilitate, how to plan for more properties. And the reason why is because I did it myself, right? So having someone that understands that lifestyle and how to best plan and make sure you can pick up many doors kind of going forward is super helpful. Um, and just understand the lingo and, and the lifestyle because a lot of times, um, like I said, I, I end up getting called in last minute um, to help you know, interpret something, save something that has to be. And if we just started out on the right foot uh, with someone who is more knowledgeable about it, um, then your experience probably be a lot, you know, a lot more smooth uh, than, than it can or what you had gone through. So um, all that being said, um, that's the general overview of the VA loan. I know there's a lot of information. Um, I know there's different levels of experience out there, but what I want to do is at this time, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the chat and I'm going to start knocking down the questions and tie it. You better have a bunch for me because I know uh, you were starting out strong. So let me see um, what we're looking at for questions here. Um, so what about VHA, VA rehab? So VA rehab, um, that's pretty involved. Um, there are approved uh, contractors that are out there, approved contractor lists, right, that, that I would tell the borrower they should look into first. If not, uh, not a big deal. You can actually bring the contractor you want to work with to the table, and then we could get them certified or they call them protected, right, of sorts, and then add them to the list. Um, there's We have an entire... At Cross Country Mortgage, we have an entire construction department, right, that handles and they are experts in this field. So they handle every construction or rehab load that goes through um, the company. And these individuals turn on these things so fast and they are one time close as well, which is an amazing, amazing opportunity. A lot of times, a lot of lenders do a two time close kind of thing and they allow the distributions of the payout to the contractors to happen on the contractor's schedule too. So um, unlike many banks, they're very rigid in how they do things but they're very amenable here across country to facilitate uh, the timelines that are set by the actual contractors. But there's a lot, there's a lot more involved, like plans have to be written. Of course, the um, home has to appraise, you know, for whatever the after repair value is going to be, right? And then of course, the individual has to qualify for the after repair value as well. So um, a lot more detail that goes into it. If, um, if you want, we can definitely um, chat offline or I can put you in touch with the construction team because they definitely have um, they have a lot of a lot of details and it's a lot more complicated um, and that process can be a lot more drawn out like there are you know new builds could take up to you know 360 days kind of thing uh, depending on where you're at who you're working with and things of that nature so uh, but yes it is possible and the VA does have a rehab loan um, the VA told me about two months ago that if you contact them at least three days before closing they can clear up your entitlement um and clear up your entitlement for purchasing again time i'm sorry i'm not following that one um 
if you're buying again. Yes. Um, so if you are purchasing again and you say clear up your entitlement, let's say, let's say you're, I'm assuming, uh, I'm gonna make an assumption here that you are, you are selling and then buying again, right? So if you sell and you have a closing disclosure or settlement statement, right? You could actually do it within 24 hours. I mean, yes, they would like to have, they would like to have more time, but honestly, when you submit the request, um, a lot of times what I do to kind of cheat the system, I just make a phone call to the BA Regional Loan Center. I'm like, hey, here's the reference number for the application I put in. We're closing tomorrow. I need it to happen now. And then they'll turn it and they'll send it. They'll just email it directly to me. I have what I need. Therefore, um, they'll reset the COE. I have that. Then you can close the next day kind of thing. Now, obviously, timing wise, everybody needs to be on the same page, understand the implications and risks associated, right? If the VA isn't very um, responsive. Um, but yes, you can actually clear up the COE um, almost on the spot. Um, are considerations taken regarding the down payment of the funds coming from the sale of your current house? Um, yes, if you are, so the way that when we build out a loan, if you are, let's say you're making, uh, you're selling a home and you're gonna make $50,000 on it, right? And you're going to take that money and you're going to put it into a, a down payment on the new home, then yes, we would just have the proceeds from that sale. And a lot of times the title companies or escrow companies involved, they will wire that money directly to the, the other agency that's handling the transaction. Therefore, it never touches your hands. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it just because it's simple. It costs less money, right? And it saves a lot of time. But yes, we can account for that. What we need to have is a copy of the settlement statement. Basically, you close on the home or a copy of the final CD in preparation for the settlement statement to come out. And then as long as we have that information, then yes, they can just, they can wire it directly over. Um, are there restrictions? I think you answered that. Great, Brian again. Okay, after this is done, I like to talk to you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Elaine, no, no issues. We can definitely talk um, offline if necessary. And there's, like I said, my, my information is right there. Um, feel free to give me a ring or shoot me an email and then we can set up a separate time. I actually have uh, another VA loan seminar to give um, this afternoon, but yeah, if you want to shoot me an email at austin.yagle at mycccmortgage, um, then I will get with you and we'll set up a time to talk. Um, Austin, right. we have a question in the Q&A box. Can VA financing apply to a working farm? Say that, I'm sorry, one more time. Um, we have a guest asking if VA financing applies to a working farm to a working farm um is there a home on the working farm i'm not seeing any clarification okay. jay can you let us know if there's a home on that so farm typically like the rural stuff like obviously usda which they also offer you know zero down product kind of things but there's a home on on the yes. on the working farm there's a home on the working then, farm. okay then there's a there's a potential there's just there's a lot of details that go into that just to make sure um, because sometimes individuals like to use income that's coming off of the farm to help qualify and things like that. So we would have to, and Jay, we can dig into that uh, a little more if you want to. Um, and I can, by all means, like I have access to our underwriters. I can send your specific scenario to them and, and see kind of what the, the result is. But as long as it's geared toward a home and also obviously the house itself, um, needs to meet the you know, VA guidelines, meaning it's got to be livable and things like that. A lot of times, and I'm not making any assumptions about the working farm, but if there's like work to be done on it or it hasn't been like kept up over, over the years, um, they can find a lot of things that need to be repaired prior to the veteran occupying. Um, but uh, yeah, we can definitely dig into that more, Jay, if you, if you want to, and I can send over your specific scenario. I just want to get more details on, um, on the working farm before I try to speak intelligently to it. Um, I, let's see, I heard a lot of homeowners won't accept VA loans because no down payment. So Love that question, yeah, this is, <laughs> this comes up all the time. And honestly, it's, and don't, I don't want to blame the homeowners, right? Because a lot of times it's not even the homeowners, it's the real estate agents, right? They're the VA loan inherently back in the day, um, was more difficult, right? Because of the guidelines they want you know, the, the criteria to, to meet your you know, appraisers to certify the home and all like that, all that stuff. There was more issues that home or sellers were seeing with buyers that were going VA versus not. A lot of things have changed since then. I don't typically see appraisers come back with too many or very many repairs at all 
Um, yes, there is the escape clause that allows the borrower to back out, you know, if it doesn't appraise and things like that. But remember, that's that's VA and FHA. That addendum is signed for both products. So I, I don't want people to like look down on the VA product. A lot of times I have to go to bat or call the listing agent and describe to them how fast that we still can close, right? And that we can make, you know, make it work regardless of it's zero down, right? As long as the individual can qualify, then don't hold it against the, the product, right? That's the, and inherently that's what happens because the, the agents are the ones that are talking to the seller and they're putting it in their, you know, in the back of their head that, hey, it's a bad product. Now, yes, I will tell you the last six months it hasn't necessarily been favorable for VA loans. And that's because a lot of the buyers that have been coming to the table were putting, you know, it's either cash or on the conventional side, the conventional side, they were waiving all the contingencies that were out there. So yes, it was hard to compete. And unless you had a seller that was maybe either a prior veteran or um, was you know supporting veterans, like then they'll choose them over another offer. But at the end of the day, even if you had two VA offers come to the table, right? And one of them said, hey, I'm going to give you 20 grand over asking, right? Okay. And the other one didn't. And they're both going zero down, right? I'm alone. Well, if he has the financial ability to do the 20 grand over asking, regardless of what the appraisal comes in at, well, then that's the stronger offer, right? So a lot of people get wrapped around at this, the product and it's not necessarily the product, right? It's, it's, the, also, it's the strength of the borrower, regardless of the product. Now, the fact that you have the ability to go zero down, if anything, what I always tell the listing agent, that gives us more cash to support the closing cost, to support an appraisal shortfall. It's actually the reverse, right? But the problem is there's just this negative, um, I don't know, light that's shine on, on the VA it, it is, it's changing. Don't get me wrong. It's changing. And I have veterans getting the homes all the time, regardless of the competition that's happening out there. Part of it is, is just reinstating confidence in the agents that, that I'm somebody as a lender, right? That can perform the VA, do it efficiently and do it on time because everyone associates the VA with long lead times and all that stuff. But I will tell you, I mean, I was not even three months ago here in Fallbrook, California, and this doesn't speak to every area. It's just because appraisers here are plentiful, but I mean, we did a VA loan in 15 days, right? So you can move, right? If you go with a professional organization and this is what they're doing, right? And as long as you describe this and talk to the listing agent or even the buying agent about it, then it helps change the mindset about the VA. But it's very frustrating for me because um, it's fine. I feel like it's an uphill battle. And I always get that question a lot of times. And it, remember, it's not the product, it's the strength of the borrower at the end of the day. So hopefully that answers awesome. your question. We have, a, we have a couple of agents here at Century that have shared conversations about this. And I, in the beginning, you had mentioned you know, so often it's about the education of the agent, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of our agents, when they send in a VA loan, they attach like an entire like, hey, here's a flyer just showing the misconceptions and the strength of a VA loan. So I think that makes it even more important when yes. you are looking to use your VA loan, you have an agent who understands that and, and like fights to educate other agents because. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right because part of it is just it's misinformation and it's easy when you just keep hearing it in the office like um oh, don't take the VA loans, take the VA loans, right? It's just like the subliminal messaging that keeps taking place, and so yeah, we're just got to break that as much as possible. Um, all right. So let's see, can you use a VA loan to build a new home on land you already own? Yes, you can absolutely do that. So that's a VA construction loan. And once again, very similar to what I said uh, before about the rehab portion, we have an entire department for that. So we would build the loan out, right? So we look at the, the, the cost or the value of the land, which you already own. And then we look at the plans that you have in place by whatever contractor put them open, you know, gave them to you. And then together, right, they create an evaluation of what we project it to be. And then you start building the house. And of course, um, as long as it appraises, then there are no issues. You can actually obtain the loan on that new construction uh, through the VA. So it's actually um, through our department, uh, the VA construction loan is the flagship product uh, and they're super aggressive about it. So up to 647,200, right? You can go 100% loan to value um, and have, I want to say, uh, don't quote me on this one. I want to say it's like a 680, 640 credit score somewhere around there, high sixes. Um, and then you can go over 647,200. Um, you can actually go up to 1.5 million. The issue is when you go over that county loan limit, um, then that's where it requires to have at least 5% down. So it'd be a 95% loan to value. Although it's the VA, I understand that there's still a requirement uh, to bring a 5% down payment, which is way better 
than you know going conventional um, and you get the great rate kind of thing. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, how does that differ from a new build and a plan unit development? Um, because you are not putting the plans together. So a new build is just you show up, the contractor's already got their cookie cutter template, right? You're purchasing a home directly from the builder, right? Builders already put it all together. Um, obviously it'd be like any other purchase. You get an appraisal done. Um, you would get termite done. I mean, they would have to go through everything. Obviously those would be probably relatively easy as long as, you know, let's, you know, as long as it's not the first home in the, in the development, you know, the appraisal shouldn't be an issue because obviously all the homes before that have sold for, you know, roughly the same price. Um, and then also the termite, right? Brand new home. I wouldn't expect any termite damage, but yeah, it's the construction loan is different because you are working with the contractor, right? And the contractor is approved and it could be, I mean, a custom built home, it could be a templated home that they already have on file. But the fact is that you're purchasing the land either at the same time that you are getting the loan or you already have the, the land as mentioned um, earlier. So you own the land, now you're building on top of it, but it's not like a, a plan unit development um, where a contract and all that stuff is already set. You're just purchasing you know, one of their plans. So hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, plan new builds are basically the same thing as purchasing a pre- um, or current standing home, I guess, would be the best way to put it. So it's, I think that's all the questions right now. Um, all right, so if there's nobody, I mean, feel free to keep filling up the chat, like by all means. Uh, what I'm gonna do is there was a list of questions that um, Nicola had went ahead and sent over to me, I guess that was put together by many people that were gonna attend. So what I'll do is I'm gonna kind of skim through these if you guys don't mind, and just kind of go through some of the things that I'm, I'm seeing um, and, and answer those questions. Thanks, Austin. Um, say again? Thanks, Austin. Oh, yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> All right. So we covered a bunch. Of, we covered a lot of information. So I'm going to pick up some of the stuff that uh, we did not cover. Um, can active duty servicemen apply before honorable separation? Um, absolutely. So I will tell you, though, when I, you know, I always usually pulse the crowd whenever I'm doing these seminars. I want to always ask who's already active duty, right? Because a lot of times what you find is a lot of people, a lot of veterans don't actually start looking into this process until after they're already beginning the transition process, right? I think you can, I think you can start resign resignation about 18 months out, I believe. Don't quote me on that one. But um, the point being is if you are within 12 months of your contract ending or your EAS or ETS, retirement, whatever the case may be, within that 12 month window, I cannot, I cannot use your LES or any income on your LES as qualifying income, right? So I want to say that again, cannot use your military income for qualifying if you're within 12 months of your contract ending. Now, if you were like right at the cusp of, you're like at 14 months, you better close on a house before you hit that 12 month window. Like close of escrow has to be outside of that 12 month window. So this is where you put the plan in place. How do I best put myself into a position to purchase during transition, immediately upon separation, whatever the case may be. So the VA guidelines state that if you have an, an offer letter, right, from a, an employer, then we can utilize that income as qualifying. So if, you know, you have a base salary or you have an hourly rate, we do the calculations for monthly income, we can use that for qualifying. So yes, an active duty service member can apply, we can pre-approve them, but just know that the income they use needs to be documented, meaning it has to be from an employer if they're going to civilian employment. If they're retiring, then we can pre-calculate retirement income based on years of service and rank, right? I will tell you though, unless your personal situation dictates that you purchase prior to separation um, and you have all those documents, I always tell people if they have a VA disability uh, claim that's currently pending, right? it may be advantageous of them to wait until separation. And the reason why is when they get awarded, right, they're now exempt the VA funding fee. Also, they now have an income. So like 100% disability, I think for a single individual is like $3,332, I believe for 2022. Don't quote me on that. Um, but the point is I can use that as qualifying income, right? So now it's tax-free income that I can use towards helping pay your mortgage, right? And if you take tax-free income that's paying a mortgage, now you get to take the interest from that mortgage and write it off and lower your base income, wherever it's coming from, right? So there's a lot of advantages to having a lot of that documentation put in place because it may boost your purchase price pretty significantly based on your rating. Also, it avoids thousands of dollars in the VA funding fee. So there's a lot of benefits to that. But once again, it's all based on your personal plan. So that doesn't necessarily, that mold doesn't 
fit everybody. Um, if there's someone that's like, hey, I need a house. I need to put my you know, family under the roof. I need to be in this new location. I can't wait. Got it. Then move forward, right? It is what it is. You eat the cost of the funding fee, right? You may, your purchase price might be a little bit lower because you don't have that additional disability income, or maybe um, the job, you know, has you on a, a probationary rate or whatever the case may be. There can be a million different reasons, but once again, personal situation dictates. And that's why you just talk to somebody that can walk you through that and give you all the, the implications tied to your decision. And then you can make the best, best, you know, pick the best course of action from there. Um, so that I want to answer that one. Um, let's see um, investments. So uh, one of the questions is uh, they want to know about, uh, purchasing investment properties using the VA home loan. So I mentioned it earlier. I just want to reiterate a VA loan is intended for a primary residence, meaning the VA wants to know that you are going to walk in the door, put your head in the pillow, and you are living there, right? And your intent is to continue living there, right? A misnomer, a lot of people think that, um, I, I don't know if it was mentioned, uh, but they, hey, we need to be in the VA loan uh, for a year, or we need to be in, you know, we need to be in there for three years. That kind of stuff. There's a lot of misinformation out there. The VA guidelines state that the only requirement for the VA is that you occupy the home within 60 days. So that means that you are at the residence living there in 60 days. Now, if you're active duty, your spouse or your dependent children can occupy on your behalf. If you since separated, then your spouse and children can occupy on your behalf, but there needs to be documentation that you are going to occupy within 12 months um, of their of, of the close of escrow, right? If you are a civilian having your family occupy on your behalf. Um, the year long thing, uh, being in the property that long, that's usually tied to the lender. And yes, we all have like law, most lenders have paperwork saying if you're getting a primary residence, getting the primary interest rates, then yes, your butt needs to be in that house for about a year, right? Um, obviously life dictates, right? If you get into a house and then within six months, all of a sudden you get orders and you PCS across the nation, no one's gonna bat an eye, right? That's that's out of your control. The government's telling you to go somewhere or let's say you get a job change, right? And the civilian side and you have to go somewhere else. Once again, it, employment dictates where you need to be, so be it. No one's gonna bat an eye about it, um, but just something to be aware of. Um, but yes, the VA loan is not an investment tool. I can't you know, live in my primary residence and go buy a property down the street, right? And that's what usually a lot of times veterans wanna do like, hey, I'm going to buy a property, you know, in the same neighborhood or the same town, but the property is the same square footage and the same amount of bedrooms. Well, then to a third party underwriter, like think about that perspective, it's like, well, what's the likelihood that you actually are going to go physically locate over there if it's the same exact property? It makes no damn sense, right? So the idea is that you need to have a logical, logical explanation as to why you're moving. So, um, and a couple of examples are, let's say you have another child, right? And it's like, well, I need another bedroom, right? Or I have my first child, I wanna be in a better school district or a lower crime rate. And yes, we're in the same town, but there's a reason why I'm leaving. To the VA, that makes sense, right? To underwriters, that makes sense. Hey, I am doing it and I have justification for it. It makes sense because I'm going from three bedrooms to four bedrooms because I have another child um, or I need better schools. And then I can go rent that other property out. Um, and I can even leave the VA alone on that too, right? If you use your tier two benefit, like we talked about earlier. The biggest thing is now that we got to get the lease on that property or we use the market rental uh, rate. And then now we can offset that mortgage on your debt to income ratio using 75% of that lease that's in place or the market rent, right? So that's one way that we can kind of save your debt to income ratio. So you don't take a hit on two mortgages. Um, now, if you can absorb it, great. If you can't, um, then, you know, maybe uh, like reevaluate kind of what the plan is going forward. But um, as far as investment properties, yeah, they're definitely something to consider. Um, uh, like I said, you can use it. Like I said, I, I did it when I left Quantico. I had an investment property, um, but, you know, I've since sold. But the idea is that, yes, you can have it as an investment with a VA loan on it. You just can't purchase it with that intent. Um, let's see. Nearing retirement, I think we talked about all that. You can use retirement income. Um, and then of course you can keep uh, real estate. Yeah, I think we covered majority of the stuff that's in here. Um, let's see, any other questions in the chat? Let's see. Let's see. Okay, I yeah, no, I don't see anything that. else. Uh, feel free to come off. Uh, I don't know if they, can they come off mute to, to ask any questions if they want to? Not in this webinar style, okay. but you guys are welcome to type any questions okay. in. Um, save Austin's email there. And I also put an email for Century as well. So if anything comes up in the future, 
um, please reach out. We want to help share this information. We'll be sharing this recording as well, Austin. So I'm sure we'll get cool. pinged in the future. Sure. Um, this recording and this presentation is not a secret. So if you know anyone who could benefit from this information, you are so welcome to share. And we would love for you to just share. Um, I know Austin has a heart for service and Century Residential. We were started because our our founder too was buying a house, um, had a real estate agent that completely took advantage of his situation and he would have financially ruined himself if it hadn't been for him getting orders to deploy and being able to back out of that loan. So we are on a mission just to educate and we appreciate for everyone joining this webinar as well. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, uh, the touch on that, a lot of it's just education. It's just knowing, it's knowing what to do. It's knowing how to do it. And then talking to somebody that's going to help facilitate it, right? I have, you know, I, tons of veterans that maybe not be ready right now, but we have six months, year long follow-ups, right? To eventually get them to the point where they are ready to purchase, because it's crazy to think that less than 12% of all eligible veterans actually use their benefit, which is mind blowing, right? But yeah. the idea is that the more education you get out there, the more people um, talk and help share, um, then the better off we can help, you know, grow wealth amongst the veteran community and help them get into real estate um, because it's just not, it's not very common. I mean, I'll be honest, like when I was active duty, um, going through purchasing my two homes, you know, looking back on it, you know, I'm, I'm one of those, right? I didn't turn around and educate you know, all the Marines behind me. I just, you don't think about it when you're in it and you're moving and you're going so fast, but now being on this other side where I can, you know, take a pause and kind of help and um, help individuals get through the process. Like it definitely is uh, very rewarding to see, you know, individuals get into real estate. I mean, even two years ago, I helped a Marine Sergeant down near Miramar. He got into a property. And he was super skeptical. He's like, I don't know, you know, COVID and everything breaking out in the market. And then a year and a half later, he called me. He's like, he's like, thank you so much. Like I have 150 grand in equity already in a year and a half. And I was like, dude, that's yeah. like three, four years of salary. Right. I mean, and you did nothing but just live, like pay your, like pay up, pay your rent. Right. But, but really it's just a mortgage. Um, and, you know, watching that wealth grow and having, you know, people call and be appreciative for helping facilitate it. Like it's very, very fulfilling. So like, I'm definitely all about education. That's why I'm doing another one of these seminars right after this. So, um, feel free. Yeah, please uh, reach out. Anybody, you know, um, I'm definitely here to help be a resource, just bounce ideas off of the necessary. Um, but yeah, I'm available. I'll make time for phone calls and, um, yeah, look forward to talking to all of you. you take care. Austin, we have one more question. Yeah. Um, can a civilian take over a VA loan? Um, this guest is saying, I've read where the answer is yes, if they qualify, but I've also seen lenders say no. So this is not very common at all. Of Yes, VA loans can be assumed. Um, there has to be, um, I've, I've heard of like VA to VA, meaning like using their eligibility to take place of it. Um, Yes, civilians. Um, I've heard of also doing it. I think that's um, unique um, to specific lenders. I will. I don't want to. I don't want to speak out of turn here. I've never had somebody try this. To be honest with you, um, and a lot of reasons why is because the ones that want to, they want to assume um, there's implications on the seller side as well. But what I can do, Tanya, once again, great questions. Um, I'll dig into that for you and I'll get, um, a definite answer and special and specifically not just an answer from the guidelines. Um, but I'll also look internally to cross country mortgage to see if, um, we have any, um, additional implications or what they call like lender overlays. A lot of times lenders will put their own overlays on things. Um, we're a direct seller to Ginny May, so we don't have very many until you get to like the super jumbo stuff, like past 1.5 million things. Um, but um, yeah, I can absolutely you know figure out for you um, what we can do or you know what the uh, the guidelines say. It's not very common at all. I don't think I've ever seen one done honestly. Um, but yeah, I'll dig into it, Tanya. Once again, if you don't mind, please shoot me if you haven't done so already. Just shoot me an email um, so I have your info, and um, this way I can get back to you and I'll uh, I'll look into it and try to get. Q and answer by close of business tomorrow, if I can.